Well, welcome everybody. This is the uh, uh, Living the Life of True Worship 40 Minute Study. Uh, looking at week number five, and that's the last week of our study together. So thank you all for being with us. Let me pray for us, and we'll continue uh, on looking at the uh, the Mosaic Tabernacle. Amazing thing so far here that we've examined. So, Father, I thank you, uh, as always, for your truth. Uh, Lord, for your love for us, Lord, especially for your grace and your patience, uh, your long suffering with each one of us. Uh, Father, I thank you for what you have shown us up this point in time of what true worship really is and, and how you have laid out and how you've designed uh, to approach a living God. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll continue to give us your understanding. Lord, I thank you uh, for the faithfulness of these that are, are here week after week, day after day, to open your word. And I just ask that you will just continue to release your blessings upon me. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to see if I can get the little screen going. Here we go. See what's happening. Get my screen set up. We'll go through the, the, the scripture this week. we got a lot to look at. So how's everybody doing? Karen, you okay? I am. I had to figure out where my uh, button was. Okay. Well, I so, was yes. waking, waking you up there. I know it's still morning time there. Yes, for the non-morning person. <laughs> I appreciate you being here. I really do. And so let me do a little reading right here to get us intro on this. We'll do a little marking, okay? Last week, we saw that the, uh, the furnishings in the holy place give us a really beautiful picture of the work of Jesus Christ and how we are to worship our holy God. So just a synopsis is that Jesus is the bread of life, and we are to feed upon his word. Jesus is the light, and we are to walk in his light as children of the light in this world, so that men can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, and that Jesus is our intercessor. You know, I, I have found that people will know about the bread of life and the light and the, the things that are represented by the furniture, but quite often they don't understand the intercessor part that he's always praying for us. There is no trial, testing, or temptation that we cannot bear, for his intercession sustains us and shows us his way of escape. And because of the incense on the altar burned perpetually, so we are never to cease praying, continually offering up a sweet smell and aroma of the incense of our prayers. So this beloved God is an integral part of worship. This week, we're going to learn about the holiest part of the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies. This is where God dwelt, as we've seen in the cloud of his presence. This would be the place where God and man would meet and commune. God would come down in this specific place and speak to man. What a God. We could not go to him, so he came down to us. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to look at the drawing of the tabernacle that we've been examining to see the placement of the veil. And as you do, remember, all this was made according to the pattern of the true tabernacle in heaven. So here at the bottom of this page right here, let me hit my little button. I still haven't figured out how to make that the default setting. Uh, on the bottom of the second page here, here is the placement of, uh, of the entire drawing of the tabernacle. And the veil is right there. I actually covered it up a little bit the veil that would separate uh, the holy place into two parts. So what we're going to do, we're going to read Exodus 26 right here, and we're going to mark every mention of the word veil, just with a V. So verse 31, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It, so I assume that's the veil, shall be made with uh, cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, their hooks also being of gold. Uh, I wonder if that's the hooks of the veil or the hooks of the pillars. Well, we'll just mark it and see what happens. Uh, their hooks also being of gold on four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasp and shall bring in the ark of the testimony there within the veil, and the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place 
and the holy of holies. So just at a surface reading right here, what have we learned about the veil in, in these three verses? Talk to me. It's colorful, blue and purple and scarlet. You've learned and it's colorful. Fine twisted linen. Okay, so what does that tell you? They're using the best stuff. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, it's it's, it's a it's a pretty thing. It's beautiful. Uh, what else have we learned? Skill, yeah, Karen. Skilled craft, skilled craftsmanship. Yeah, and so what does that reveal to us? Well, again, to me, it's something that's created. Something created? Yes. And so what, is, what do you mean by that? Well, God is the God of creation, right? Oh, okay. Okay. And he wanted this to be of what kind of workmanship? Well, a skillful workman. So he wanted it to be what? A fine workmanship of... Am I missing what you're trying to? No, not at all. No, no, I'm not. I'm not shooting for any particular kind of thing. Just thinking about it. If you have a skilled workman, that means it's going to be what? Fine workmanship, absolutely. It's going to be the best that can be done. And it should be made with cherubim. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, I immediately think of an angel. You think of angelic uh, beings, and so do I. Is that what's being referenced there? Hmm, I don't know. I don't have my blue letter Bible popped up on my other screen to hurry up and look. <laughs> you don't? Well, how are you going to help us if you don't have your blue letter Bible up? Well, let me get it up. <laughs> um, uh, let's see, I got a little thing right here, and it speaks of... Uh, Angelic being, guardians, you know, an image, that kind of thing. It shall be, be made with cherubim. Uh, more than likely, that means that uh, with a cherubim uh, shape, embroidery, pictures, or something like that be on it. Is that what's being said? Yeah, I don't think it really matters that much, but it's an interesting kind of thing. Uh, what else we learn about the veil? Just what we've been examining right here in these verses. They were actually told how to hang it. Gold. Uh, what, Sarah? Like barely, barely hanging here. on hooks of gold. Yeah, hanging on hooks of gold. He goes into great detail. It should have gold involved with the way that it's hung. It's got sockets. It's got clasps. He's telling them how to actually hang this thing. It's very, very important. Uh, tell me, what did we learn about uh, the various furniture that's on both sides of this veil? And what's the purpose of the veil? Separation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, separation between what? Between the, uh, the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. Exactly, between the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies. And it had a particular function particular purpose and he says it serves as a partition and so the Lord, the Lord goes into you know quite a bit of detail as to what's supposed to be happening with this thing so uh, let's look at this next little observation here oh Karen has uh, plopped up a, a bunch of stuff on the chat right there and uh, so Karen does that give us any more insight well, it lends me towards believing it it actually is um a cherubim versus just a picture of, but I can't I can't say that it absolutely is. So if it actually is a cherubim, what is what does that mean then? Well, if it says that if um it was made it shall be made with cherubim the work of a skillful workman, that that cherubim is a skillful workman. So are you saying that it's made by angels? 
Well, I don't know that I am as much as the text is. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, I can't say that 100% because I haven't really dwelled on it enough. You what know, do you I, think? I don't know either. I don't know either. I was sort of struck by that phrase I hadn't really been struck by it before until I went through this. And I went, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? Well, what when you got it shall be made and then with cherubim and then the work of a skillful workman, it lends me to believe it is a cherubim doing this. Here's what verse uh, it says in the King James, and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine a uh, twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made. Well, I was reading uh, the New American Standard, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I am too. <laughs> That's what this is. But it is one of those little subtle things that you just go, I wonder what that means. And sometimes it sort of helps, you know, look around. But anyway, uh, somehow there were cherubims involved with this, either way you go. So here's the observation. Each piece of the furniture in the tabernacle was a picture of Jesus Christ. So what then did the veil picture for us? We've actually looked at this before, but we'll look at it here. Let's read can I ask a quick question? You can ask a slow question, sweetheart, sure. <laughs> well, if it was... If it wasn't a cherubim who made this, you know, lends me to believe how was it put up? I mean, that's not what the that's not what we're looking at right at the moment. But um, in other words, I can't think of why it would be something or er, someone earthly. Okay, I'll quit now on the veil. Just when you got me totally confused, you're going to quit. <laughs> That wasn't confusing. Well, I'll say it again. I'm really slow today. <laughs> so you think it's like a supernatural. And really, supernatural is not a correct term for a cherubim. But you think it's a, a cherubim of God that's actually making this. Oh, I, would, I would lend myself more towards that than it be... Um, made a different way, made by a human. Um, and would, one of the reasons would be hanging it. But Well, I think it's more that it's just a, the work of a skillful workman because everything else made in the Tabernacle of Moses was made by human hand, even the Ark uh, of the Covenant. Yeah, I stand, I stand corrected to have to think through that thought even more now. No, no, no. And it's not a point of standing correcting. It's iron sharpening iron. You working through my confusion, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't mean that negative. It's just that, you know, I was just thinking about what led yeah. me to that belief, and I know we have to move on. What led me to look at it even more that way is it being the veil and humanly. Of course, you know, it could have been put up there humanly sure. because of yeah. them building you know, all that they built otherwise, man built otherwise in that time. So I'll take back my thought. Well, and, it, and the whole thing with the tabernacle particularly was it was made to be taken down and put up, taken down and put up, the scribes, the sockets, the scribes, the clasp, to hold it in place and all that kind of thing. But it is interesting how different uh, translations of the Bible will lead your mind toward uh, a certain direction. And Karen and I were both being led a particular direction that we'd never seen before. When I go back and check it against the authorized verse where it says, you know, cunning work with cherubims, plural, uh, shall it be made. That gives far more an understanding, okay, it's, it's probably having cherubims, you know, a design nature of the actual veil there, you know. But when I read it this other way of the New American Standard, I think, well, that sort of led my mind a particular way. So, Lord, guide my mind, you know. What's being said right here? And so this is the way that we really should reason through Scripture and try to understand what it says. So I like that. That's good. I'm going to be thinking I have, that. I have a quick statement that it made me think about you know we're talking about the the, the veil and the purpose of it um you know it was a partition to separate and it's uh the garden of eden genesis 3 24 uh says he drove the man out and at the east of the garden of eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life um because they were in in sin when he kicked them out of Eden. Um, and so I, I think that the veil represents somewhat, and that's why the cherubim uh, guarding 
that Garden of Eden, in a sense. So you're, you're seeing the cherubim right here is functioning, picking up that motif that you see in Genesis of guarding mm -hmm. and, and uh, controlling access to something. Yeah, representing. Ooh. I because like we don't have, you know, we we lost access, you know, in the to the Garden of Eden. Did we lose access? Yeah, when they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. Yeah, we we. Uh, we gave up access. We acquiesced access. Yeah. 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 I, I, I mess with the three of y'all because y'all are sharp cookies. See. <laughs> in our definition that I put up there, um, Shar brings up uh, an interesting point because um, yes. as number one under A was as a guardian of Eden. Eden. Yeah. And I don't understand what flanking. God's throne would mean. I don't understand the word flanking. Do you? Yeah, flanking. Either means, side. Either oh, side. Sorry. Yeah, on both sides. And so you have it with the Ark of the Covenant. You know how they hover on either side of the Ark of the Covenant? And, uh, and then in heaven, you see them all around God's throne. So, uh, ooh, that's really Thank good you. Stuff. Oh, are you kidding? Thank you all. So, uh, where are we here? Each piece of the furniture, in the middle of this page right here, of the tabernacle is a picture of Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at a Hebrews 10 to see what the veil pictures. And we're going to mark Jesus every time with a cross. And then we're going to continue marking veil. So Hebrews 10, 19 through 20 here. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. So according to Hebrews 10 right here, what does the veil picture? What does it represent? His flesh. Yeah, the flesh of Jesus. And it's really, it says that inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. I mean, that's very, very directed. So, when to enter into the Holy of Holies, what do you have to pass through? Through the veil. Let's pass through the veil. So, what does that say to us as New Covenant believers? What has happened to us? The way we can go is through Jesus. So, the only way to enter to the presence of the Most High God is through what? Through Jesus. Through the blood of the Lord the Jesus blood. Christ. Is that a point of uh, confusion and or contention among the body of Christ today? Yes. Yes. In what way? I hate it when... Hey, Karen, we just lost you. I heard you say I hate it then. Can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. I hate it when I don't have enough coffee in the morning because I, I need the answer to this and I can't pull my words together. Um, well, it's, so, it's so entertaining on our part. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, hey, Karen, just to check you. You know we love you, right? Oh, of course. Okay, good, good, good. Uh oh. I know ultimately in what I'm I'm uh, was trying I'm what I'm thinking and I can't get out. Ultimately, being saved through the blood of Christ does le lead to the lordship um, of Christ, and I can't pull it together. I'm sorry. Okay, so you you got some thoughts floating around in your brain right there. I understand yeah. that totally. Yeah. Hey, what I about this? Kind of stuck. I heard this yesterday. Okay, y'all tell me about this. I heard this preached yesterday. And uh, uh, the, the, the person speaking said that Jesus, uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, the life. He's the only one that, by whom you can have access. And he said, uh, that's what I believe, and I know that's how I'm saved. Now, there may be other ways uh, unto God, but that's what I believe. What do you say when you hear that? Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> and so 
I, I have, I have, and, and Karen, I know you do. You have tremendous grace and mercy for people who speak and people who teach, because uh, we all make mistakes. We stick our feet in our mouth. We say things that are dumb. We say things out of ignorance. We say things out of just clumsiness of tongue. And so I'm thinking, okay, maybe perhaps he just didn't realize what he said until he said it again about five minutes later. What do you do with that? And and I'm I'm hoping to have opportunity maybe sometime to uh, you know share as we're going along uh, that hey you know to say that Jesus is the way the truth and the life that is a point of declaration and it is either true or it's not true yes Karen the rest of that verse says no one comes to the Father but by me and I think yes. the most kind and loving thing to do is not wait for a lot of time to go by but to actually open up a Bible and uh, turn it to him and say, would you mind reading the rest of that verse and let him argue with scripture? Yeah, yeah. And and the sad thing was, I think this was just said, because I'm just listening to it, you know, and uh, um, yeah, sure, exactly. John says there's no other way the Father. I, I think that it's an environment, this particular thing is an environment of such political correctness that even in trying to ease the tension that God created there with the saying, there's no other way but Jesus and through the veil into the Holy of Holies, that they try to uh, sad consciousness. And it's really sad. I mean, it's sad all the way around. Uh, yeah, whoever that was that waved at me. I, was it Karen? That, that was me. But, you know, and you know how merciful I am. Um, yes. That, you know, but the church does that too. The church won't stay to stand it. firm on who God is his characteristics and his way and only his way to you know salvation so yeah. it's a little bit you know that's my bailiwick right oh yeah that's the reason i set you off on it i, I, I looked at this lesson the other day and i thought oh karen's going to go off on this <laughs> and i think it should be for all of us because it's totally undermined the uh uh the truth of the gospel of the good news i mean it's, it's a really serious situation of problem and the power in his name. Yeah. 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 I was talking with a local pastor that just had a wonderful breakfast with him. Just a great time. We were talking about some things and some things that we consider and, and the way churches are approaching things and what they're, how they're doing stuff. And um, and it, it, really, it really grieves our heart. We were speaking really in love. And I finally just looked at him. I said, here's the problem with so much of what's happening, particularly with certain movements and certain things that are going on, that people on the outside, even people from within look at it and considered to be successes. I said, where's the Romans one thing? Where is what Paul said, that the, uh, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? And, um, and even in these pictures of what we're seeing with worship right here, we, we want to try to create our own thing, and, um, and, and we're bearing the fruit of that. So anyway, let's press on here in Exodus 25 where we're about to go. Uh, to understand, uh, why it is that a new and living way uh, had to come about? When they sort of press on the study, it says right here that what happened with the Ark of the Covenant, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and that kind of thing. So here's the observation. Uh, look at the drawing of the tabernacle you have there. I hope you got your books open on page 59. I'm not going to flip there, but you can see it. And note where the Ark of the Covenant is situated in the tent of the meeting. That's an amazing thing when you look at the entire thing. Uh, just the dimensions of it uh, from the Pentateuch is just amazing. Uh, on top of the ark was the mercy seat, which had above it the two cherubim of gold, one at each end. So we're going to read Exodus uh, 25 here, and we're going to mark I. Every time you see the, the word I, that's speaking of God, we're going to mark it with a triangle. And then we're going to mark every occurrence of uh, ark with a rectangle. We're just going to mark it. And then every reference to the mercy seat, uh, we're going to mark it with God with dots to represent blood okay and we're going to actually mark blood later on in the passage so so y'all sort of hold me to this because it's sort of an extended passage here so here's exodus 25. they shall construct an ark of acacia wood uh two and a half cubics long and one and a half cubics wide and one and a half cubics high you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside you shall overlay it and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings for it. 
and fasten them on its four feet, and two rings shall be on one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark to carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed from it. You shall make a mercy seat. Let's see if I can do three dots. There we go. A mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubic wide. You shall make two cherubim of gold. Make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim <clears throat> shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat. There's mercy seat again. With their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. So allow me a moment here to flip the page. See, did I get the right? Yeah. You shall put the mercy seat. Ah, the mercy seat. Let me correct that. There we go. The mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark, you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. Ooh. Quite a uh, lengthy passage here. So just very quickly, tell me what you've learned about the ark from everything we just marked there. What do we know about this ark? Just general things. We definitely know um, its description. Oh. Yeah, that, that's great. We know the dimensions of it. We know what it's made of. We know how it's made. Uh, we know where it's supposed to be placed. Yeah, Karen? There must be something very important for about that for us to know that, out of all the things God could have put in his word. You mean that kind of detailed about the dimensions and stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think one, you, one thing think if... That might be? <clears throat> well, I think one thing, if not anything else, it shows us that God is a God of order. Okay. What else could it be? Well, it's also what he's what he has built it with. Um, it wasn't just um, any kind of wood or. Um, he just didn't throw it together and just use scrap whatever. Right, right. Yeah. And so what you see is you see a design, right? You see plant. You see the Lord giving man instruction. Could, could that also show not only that, but could it show because of the elements that he used, the uh, materials, could that show character? Yes, absolutely. And you can find vast volumes, I mean, uh, I, I have some, uh, that go into very, uh, yeah, char has got the word, very specific, careful detail about the type of wood, wood that was used, acacia wood, I think the King James calls it shittim wood, I think that's what it is, and the nature of it, how it's a, a very hard kind of wood, how it's overlaid with gold. Actually, the dimensions, there's been a lot of people through the ages that have attempted to extrapolate uh, what those dimensions might represent in the terms of timing, uh, years. Uh, I mean, you can imagine how man might go uh, well beyond even the counsel of the Word of God as to what these things may or may not mean, you know. Uh, but I think the big thing for us to understand is exactly what Karen said, that the Lord has planned this. He's laid it out. I've been intrigued myself with, you know, what those dimensions mean. And then you run into all sorts of things because we know it's a cubic, but how long is a cubic? And so you have one particular kind of cubic that's around 18 inches, and you have another cubic that may be around 22 inches, and we don't know beyond any shadow of a doubt. So we just want to be careful. But what do we learn about this? We know that God gave them 
exactly what they need to know and how to design this thing. Um, also, the, the, you have the art, but you have the art, and the art had a, a, a covering, for lack of a better term, something that was on top of it. And what was that called? Yeah, that was the mercy seat, right? It was the mercy seat. The cherub uh, were to be designed, laid on both sides of it. Uh, what is that? Yeah. Isn't it interesting what the mercy seat is made out of? What's it made of? Pure gold. In contrast to what? Not pure gold. Mm -hmm. Imperfect. Can you make something of pure gold? <laughs> well, were you going to finish? Or were you going to say more to that question? No, that was just a question. Well, I, I think of a lot of things. I think about refiner's fire. You know, I think about the, you know, one of the um, most precious metals. I think of the price of gold today. Um, why it's a wanted commodity. Um, yeah. Well, the in price light of. Yeah. In light of who we're talking about. Right. The price of gold today is not so much a factor of the gold as it is a factor of what's happened to the dollar, but the point's well taken. Uh, Shar has got the thing I was wondering about. Uh, uh, it would be very malleable. Gold in and of itself is very soft. The gold that we have that we wear for jewelry and stuff like that is mixed with something else to give uh, uh, longevity to it and things like that. And so if something is made of pure gold, what this is, it's going to be very uh, malleable. It's going to be, uh, I want to say sensitive, but that's not exactly the word. Okay, But you see that it is very valuable. So this was on the top. Um, what did we learn about God in, in these last couple of verses? God said something. He, he tells them some things about himself. What's he going to be doing in relationship to all this? <laughs> it's sound investment. <laughs> Oh, that's cute, Karen. I get that, yeah. Karen says, it's seen as a sound investment today. Did you mean to do that little play on terms that you just did, Karen? Of course I did. So what do you mean by that? Well, it's interesting. Man puts his trust in something material on this side of heaven, um, and gold is seen as that sound investment. But look at just when we look at the mercy. I mean, I've never thought about this before, but the sound investment of the mercy seed of Christ when we're in him and his mercy. So continue. What do you mean? Well, it, it's pure and it's lasting. Right. I mean, it, it's uh, to desired far above. Eh. See, yeah. I'm stuck. You know, I, I got a stuck moment. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine because uh, you didn't mean what I thought you meant, and this is even better because what you said is absolutely right. It is the, the, the better investment than the things of the world. But above that mercy seat, God said, I will speak to you. The sound investment, the sound of the voice of the Lord here guiding and directing. You see what I mean? Yes. You know, I'm so glad to know that someone gets what I try to say every once in a while. <laughs> that's great. No, that's great. That's really good because that's what he was saying. He said, above, God says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to meet you here above, from above this mercy seat between the two cherubs and above the Ark of the Testimony. He had a very precise place right there. He said, I'm going to speak to you, and I'm going to give you commandments to the sons of Israel. Was the Was the Ark empty? I always think you're asking a trick question, but no. Aaron's rod. Isn't Aaron's rod in the budding something or other in there? Oh, well, there's going to be some stuff in there. What did he describe in these verses right here of saying was going to be in there? In verse 21, he tells us what? He says, you should put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you will put the testimony which I will give to you. Oh, yeah. oh Shar said, question. yeah. Yeah, Shar put down verse 21. Oh, no, it wasn't a trick question. It's just, uh, 
you know, okay. just put the testimony. Uh, we have, you know, uh, the full counsel of the word floating between our ears somewhere, right, Karen? Somewhere there, it's all there. Yeah. And uh, But that's really interesting to see what he says and what's going to be happening right here. Uh, so uh, where are we uh, in observation? Our next passage we're going to look at will tell us what was to be put in the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, the stuff we were just talking about, okay? And so this is going to be uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 3 through 4. But before I turn the page, let me read this little insight right here. Uh, in the Greek, altar, which we'll see here in Hebrews 9, 4, is literally censer. The golden censer was taken into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. It was, um, if incense was not taken off the altar of incense in the holy place, and taken in the Holy of Holies, the priest would die. We saw that last week. Exodus 31 and Leviticus 16 make it clear that the altar of incense was in the holy place in front of the veil. Now, here's what they're talking about. There can be some confusion. Look up here at the top of the page. Right here is the altar of incense. Okay, you see that right hand, top of the right hand page. And right here is the Ark of Covenant. And a couple of passages, when you read it, it looks like that this altar was inside behind the veil. It's not. The Exodus and Leviticus passage make it very obvious that it's outside the veil. But what they would do is they would take the incense off of this, and we saw it last week, and the priest would come in, and he would bow down and fill this entire area right here with incense before the Lord spoke. Okay, before the Lord spoke. So let's go to the next page here and see if I'm at the right place. Yes, thank you. So here's Hebrews uh, 9. Verses uh, 3 through 4, we're going to mark the ark and the veil. Behind the second veil, okay, behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the table of the covenant, and this is what um, Sarah was talking about a while ago. So the Ark of the Covenant was placed where? Behind the second veil. In other words, you'd have one veil coming in the holy place. Behind the Ark of Incense was another veil, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was going. And so according to this right here, y'all said it a while ago, what was in that Ark of the Covenant? Golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod, and the uh, tables of the covenant. What are the tables of the covenant? You don't know what that is, right? The tables uh, of the covenant. Ten Commandments. Yeah, I think it's the Ten tablets. Commandments. Yeah, the, the tablets, the Ten Commandments. That's what was in there. So the high priest would enter into the Holy Holies only one time a year on Yom Kippur. It was just past year, a few weeks back, the Day of Atonement. This happened on the tenth day of the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Although this high and holy day is celebrated by Jewish people around the world today, it is not celebrated in the way prescribed in Leviticus 16. And uh, they tell us because they simply they don't have a temple. And then they have the word yet. So apparently there's uh, some anticipation of there being a temple. So let's look at this, these passages here from uh, Leviticus 16. Uh, we're actually going to read through this um, twice because there's a couple things we're going to be looking for. And so. Uh, We'll read it sort of quickly. The first time, we're going to underline mercy seat. Okay, so y'all help me with this. Underline in mercy seat. We're going to mark every reference to Aaron with a P. And then we're going to mark blood like we marked the mercy seat a while ago. So we're actually marking mercy seat different than we did a while ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is uh, the biggest, chapter 16. Then Aaron, with a P, shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement as himself, for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar. Notice where that is before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. I'm not really marking veil, but there it is. He 
shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat. We're going to underline mercy seat. I think that's it. That is on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise, he will die. And that's what was referenced a while ago. Moreover, he shall take up some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood. Uh, we're marking blood. Yes, I forgot to mark blood up there. Sort of hard to do these dots right here with this machine. There we go. Some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it as the blood okay, on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out, that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. Let me read verse 34 without flipping the page here because you know how I'll, I'll lose the notations. So here's verse 34. Go ahead and mark it. Now you shall have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel for all their sins once each year and just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So he did. Now let's go back up and we're going to mark this again, but we're going to mark three more words than you saw. We're going to mark sin. We're going to mark atonement. And we're going to mark every reference to time. So verse 11, then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin, the sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement, mark it like that, for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall make a fire pan full of coals of fire from upon the altar, on the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense, and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise, he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it. That's actually blood right there. I always catch things the second time through. With his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, which is in, also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the sons. Hmm, impurities. I wonder if that would be the same as sins. Of the sons of Israel, because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting, which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Allow me to read this last verse here before I flip the page. Now you shall have this as a, a permanent statute. That would be a little clock right there. That's a timing element. To make atonement. There's a atonement again. For the sons of Israel, for all their sins. Their sins again. Once every year, there's a timing element. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses to do, he did. 
Ooh, oh, I don't know about y'all, but we could spend an entire lesson just on that passage right there. But very quickly, what did we uh, – okay, Karen, there you go. What a picture of, of purity, of life purity. Is it not? Tell me, what did Aaron have to do in this whole process right here? Tell me what he had to do for himself and for his household before he did anything else. He had to address his own sin. Yeah, he did that by what, how? What way? Well, I'm trying to find the verse, but he went in. Yeah, don't worry about the details. Just tell me. Don't, don't. It's just, he went in. He went in first for himself. Um, yeah, he offered a bull as a sin offering for himself, and he made atonement for himself and for his family. And he would go in with a fire pan full of incense. And then he would go and uh, he would offer uh, the blood of a goat of a sin offering for the people. And he made atonement for himself, but then he made atonement for the people, and he made atonement for the holy place. That's a wild thing there. In verse 16, he made atonement for the holy place. Yeah, it tells us how we pray for other people and how we do things. Because, you know, the priests could come into the holy place, and they came in on a regular basis there. And it's like purifying atonement for the actual tent of meeting, the holy place itself. But he had to deal with his own sins first before he would go in and deal uh, with the sins of others. How do I wind up for that first thing right there? I think this is where I want to go next. Yeah, verse 34. And then you find out at verse 34 right here that this is a permanent statute. They had to make this atonement. And how often did he have to do this? He had to do it how often? Yearly. Every year. Yeah, every year. What does that tell you? That it didn't fully take him away. Oh, that it didn't fully take away or... Okay. It didn't take away the sin. It just covered it over temporarily. There you go. There you go. And there, there is a distinction there between that. And so that, that's exactly what it reveals to us, that it didn't take away the sin. It simply did what? It covered the sin. Let's look at these next three verses right here quickly because I know our time is quickly running away from us. And particularly this class, I try to honor the, the lunch hour thing, you know, but you're not always successful, are we? As our great high priest, what did Jesus do? We're going to read Hebrews 9 11 right here in the bottom right. And do the same thing. Mark every reference to Christ, your Messiah, mark blood, and mark time. Um, but when Christ appeared, this is chapter 9, uh, as a high priest of the good things to come, hmm, the element of timing right there, he entered through the great and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, which we just saw, but through his own blood, he entered, through, uh, entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. But Christ did not enter a holy place made, holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for all of us. Nor was it that he would offer himself often, got a time in Elton right there, as the high priest, high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. So what's being said right here is what? He entered in when? And entered in where? And how often? So tell me quickly. He entered once for all. He um, entered once for all. Where did he enter? Into heaven him itself to appear in the presence of God for us. Yeah. In verse 24, not a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, 
but into heaven itself. There's just some really intriguing mysteries right here for me. Just some amazing things of what he did that one time. That the stuff that we've seen at this point in time was a foreshadowing of. Okay, so let me see. Am I on the right page right here? I think we are. Yeah, let's continue on. Look at Hebrews two. Therefore, he Hebrews two seventeen. He had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God to make propitiation. And they actually told us to do what with propitiation? Sort of mark that as a covering for the sins of the people. Watch what happens here in First John. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm just going to mark sin. As if anyone, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the covering for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the world. They say right here the Greek word propitiation in 1 John is halesmos. And it signifies a means whereby sin is covered and remitted. Because Jesus was able to pay for all of our sins in full. God's holiness is satisfied. Jesus is our mercy seat, the propitiation for our sins, the full payment, which is sufficient for all time. These are things, these questions that we've just discussed. What did Jesus do in regard to our sins? Not only did he cover them, he did what? Full payment of our sins. What does Jesus become to us before the Father? Hmm. Advocate. The advocate? Advocate. Yeah, the advocate. He's actually the covering also. Isn't that great? Karen says, First uh, John 2, 2 settles the error of double predestination. What do you mean by that? I think I know what you mean, but I'm not sure. Well, it says there, especially uh, the one word you left out when you were reading it, but also for those of the whole world. Um, How did I leave that out? What do you mean? Well, you just didn't read it. You weren't trying not to say something. You just did I skip really? for those of the whole world, and not only for ours only, but those. What are what's the those people? Or well, that would be sins. Yeah, that's what. Station for sins of the whole world. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that those of the whole world designates more than just one person. And you. Know, I probably said enough. No, keep saying. Well, double predestination is the um, theory attitude that some are saved for some, saved for heaven and some are damned for hell. Um, and that's oh. that's what I was talking about. And they take Romans, what is it, nine? Yeah. Um, somewhere in the thirties, um, uh, thirty-four, somewhere around in there, and they make that double predestination. I got you. I got what you're saying. Yeah. This also right here can and it is quite often mistaught and misapplied without the full counsel of the Word of God. A lot of times people will say, "Well, Jesus died for all the sins of all the world, so therefore all the world is saved." You see what I'm saying? And that's an error that's popping up on uh, a lot of stuff. So quickly, the last couple of verses here. Uh, now we're going to read Matthew 27, 51. Then I'll flip the page over to Hebrews. We'll mark Jesus, the veil, and brethren. And the verses in Matthew are an account of Jesus' as crucifixion. And the verses in Hebrews explain the significance of what happened to the veil when Jesus died. Um, I'll just tell you right here, at bottom of the page, Josephus wrote that the veil in the temple was so thick that it would take two teams of oxen pulling in an opposite direction to tear it. And it's interesting to note that the veil was torn from top to bottom. So, Matthew 27, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. I just love that picture right there. And I'm hoping this is going to take us to the right place. Did it? Yes. And it says, is therefore, brethren, uh, since we, and that's we, have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, 
by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, which is the veil. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, sometimes when we get in this right here, we might lose sight of what the whole big picture overall of everything is. What we've been examining is worship, okay? Living a life of true worship, okay? And it says here at the beginning of this week's lesson, we saw that Hebrews 10 20, that the veil is a picture of Jesus' flesh. If the Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God and the veil in the tabernacle in the temple kept the priests from entering into the Holy of Holies except on the Day of Atonement, what is God picturing for us when he tears the veil in two from top to bottom? What happened on that day when the Lord Jesus died and that veil was torn in two from top to bottom? What's the picture? What's he saying? That's an interesting picture, isn't it? I love so, reflecting back on it. Yeah. Go ahead, Karen. Well, it's a picture of God making us pure. Okay. What else? What about our access to God? The free, we all have free access now. If Jesus. you're a believer, there's no veil because we have passed through the veil. Yeah. We have passed through the veil through the uh, uh, the torn flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so how does that all that relate to the idea of worship? Uh, hit the wrong button again. Yeah, what does that say about worship? Yeah, sure. We don't have to go through the priest for that part of our our worship. We didn't yeah. have to depend on them. I, Christ is our priest. Yes, and the things that we have looked at so far, that if you enter into the, the area of the tent of meeting and you go through the altar of the, of the blood of sacrifice and you've been washed with the labor, which is a picture of the washing and the cleansing, and you enter into the uh, uh, holy place right there, and Jesus is the bread of life, and he's the light of the world, and he intercedes for us, and we enter into the holy of holies through the veil of the torn flesh of the Lord. That is the only way. It's the only way to access him that we have that access to uh, the Father now. We have that relationship. And it wasn't something we have to do every time that we uh, worship. We have to start and, and re-crucify Christ. Because he says it was once for all done for us. I love the picture that happened on that day when it was torn from top to bottom. Those priests in that temple, they were going about what they were doing at that moment. And the Holy of Holies was revealed to be empty because the Ark of the Covenant wasn't in it. It's a wild thing. Let me read this wrap-up really, really quickly. Thank you all for, for your time. Because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are cleansed once and for all and are now able to enter into the very throne room of God and find grace to help in time of need. What more could one ask for? There is no greater privilege than to have unhindered access to the throne of the Most High God through His only begotten Son, who loves us so much that He laid down His life for us. When we were sinners without hope, ungodly, literally enemies of God. So what can we do but bow down before him, presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service of worship, quote out of Romans there. So wrap up these truths in prayer. Hang on to these things. By worshiping the Lord, thanking him, praising God for all that we've learned and what it means to us. Phew, let me read these last passages right here. Hebrews 4, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and for your help, not only in time of need, Lord, but at all times. 
Father, I thank you for just a, oh gosh, just the depth of the truth that you've revealed right here to each and every one of us. And I ask, Lord, that these things will be so internalized within our spirit that our natural response will be to you. Lord, I speak your blessing upon each and every one in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all so much. If you got any other questions or anything, uh, shoot them over, okay? We'll continue next I, week. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. This is a woman thing. Who cleans the temple of all this blood? You know, they, is everything so specific? Don't I mean, you know, year after year, they keep sprinkling this blood. Who cleans it? <clears throat> you ever think about that? Oh, I think about that a lot, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Would it have required cleaning? Say that again, please. Would it have required cleaning? Obviously not, because it's not in the scripture. Everything else is quite specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about that? It didn't say anything about cleaning it. No. You clean yourself before you go in. And I was watching a program on time on TV, and they showed them sacrificing and how messy all that you know, all that blood is. Sure, and it yeah. It's dirty and awful. Yeah. So now, when you go that, into the Holy of Holies and they sprinkle all that blood around, but there's no mention of cleaning it up, I guess. Uh, there's a couple of thoughts that come to mind. On the outside, when you first come in, the uh, where they sacrifice the bulls and that kind of thing, uh, particularly the Mosaic Tabernacle. Yeah. I could see how that would not be much of a problem because they moved from time to time. Right. They relocated, that kind of thing. When you come in, you're actually sprinkling blood on the Ark of the Covenant, okay? When you're doing that, I wondered for years if blood accumulated upon the Ark, if it accumulated in front of it. But then I, I wonder if when the Lord received that offering, if he didn't cleanse it by fire and he consumed that blood offering by fire. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, I, it doesn't really say you don't want to argue from silence any other partic any, any any particular direction. I'm just sort of the mind. I'm thinking that he might have uh, purified by fire and consuming the blood that was offered as a sacrifice. Yes. Would, he would have put it if it needed to be cleaned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. See you, Char. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you all. We'll see you later. Bye.